Strange Mysteries of Titan Titan is the giant moon of Saturn. Unlike other moons, its atmosphere is substantial. Its surface has stable liquid masses, and humans have travelled there. Let's start with some background. I appreciate this tremendous planet-like setting. Titan is Saturn's sixth and final spherical moon. Unlike Jupiter's four moons, Titan is the largest of the four Galilean satellites. Comparatively, the other moons of Saturn are small. Titan is 50% larger in diameter and 80% heavier than our moon. This moon is the second largest in the solar system behind Ganymede. Therefore, it is more critical when compared directly to Ganymede. Titan's increasing apparent diameter is a result of its dense atmosphere. Titan's diameter is nevertheless more minor than that of Mercury, the least massive planet, despite Titan having only 40% of Mercury's mass due to its low density. Due to Titan's low density of 0.14 gs, or 1.35 meters per second squared, its gravity is less than that of the Moon. Unlike most astronomical objects of this magnitude, it is considered half water, half ice, and half rocks. Titan is claimed to have a distinctive interior layout. In other words, it is composed of multiple layers. Like many other large moons, the ocean beneath the moon's crust is believed to consist of water and ammonia. Owing to heat pressure and, to a lesser degree, tidal stresses, this liquid ocean resembles the magma layer between the Earth's core and crust. Cassini found radio signals of low frequency in Titan's atmosphere, indicating the existence of this liquid layer. Titan's surface does not effectively reflect low-frequency radio waves, but the planet's liquid interior does. Even though there is no proof, scientists think Titan's underground ocean is good for life. In addition, the Moon's surface characteristics have changed by up to 30 kilometers since Cassini began its investigations, indicating that the surface is floating on this liquid ocean layer rather than being attached to the core. With planned expeditions to explore this possibility, we must determine whether life exists above or below the surface. Europa is more likely to be probed for life shortly. Titan has no magnetic field because of its unique interior. Titan is shielded from the solar wind for 95% of its orbit around Saturn by Saturn's magnetosphere. Titan's orbit around Saturn is significantly eccentric since it revolves once every 15 days and 22 hours. Titan's orbital plane is also inclined, although this does not indicate that the planet has been captured. Jupiter's Galilean moons are similar. Titan is the lone survivor after catastrophic impacts destroyed several of Saturn's largest moons in the past. Medium-sized moons of Saturn like Iapetus and Rhea are supposed to represent this tumultuous origin. The daily routine of Titan, our moon, shares the same day length and orbital period as the Earth. Due to its tidal lock with Saturn, Titan can only display one of its faces at a time. This has no effect on physical appearance. Due to Titan's hazy atmosphere, the planet's surface is not visible outside. Saturn is still visible from Titan, albeit with a substantially obscured perspective. If standing on Titan, Saturn would not move across the sky. The cloud of Titan has vanished. Titan's thick atmosphere distinguishes it from the other moons in the solar system. When I first saw a photograph of it, the first thing that came to mind was Titan. Remarkable how far into space the atmosphere spreads. By viewing an image of Earth, it is evident how densely the atmosphere envelops the globe. Titan, on the other hand, is enveloped in a massive blanket. This is the result of a range of factors. Despite its much smaller size, Titan's atmosphere is 7.3 times denser per unit area than Earth's. Titan's gravity is also significantly less than Earth's. As a result, 
the downward force is diminished. Due to the atmosphere's mass, the surface pressure is 1.45 or 45% greater than on Earth. Comparing the atmospheres of Titan and Earth may reveal the distance between the two planets. The mesosphere is 600 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. The mesosphere of the Earth begins at 975 kilometers and ends at 120 kilometers. Cassini's orbit had to be changed during its closest approach to counteract air pull. Titan has a faster rotating atmosphere than Venus, indicating that it is a super rotator. In this regard, the Moon's polar regions are particularly notable. The polar vortex at each pole rotates every nine hours, whereas the Moon revolves every 16 days. Each polar vortex resembles an ongoing cyclone. Is the orange hue of the atmosphere a result of its composition? Nitrogen comprises 98.4% of the atmosphere, with methane and hydrogen comprising the remainder. Due to UV light, hydrocarbons generated from the decomposition of methane are also abundant in the upper atmosphere. It is believed that these hydrocarbons are responsible for Titan's orange hue. Due to the constant breakdown of methane into hydrocarbons, the Moon would have run out of methane after 50 million years, a relatively short time compared to the solar system's history. So there must be a source of methane replenishment, which is most likely cryovolcanoes. Titan's temperature would be considerably lower if its atmosphere did not contain methane. On the other hand, biological life is not ruled out. On the other hand, the haze reflects a lot of sunlight, which makes methane emit fewer greenhouse gases. Titan is so far from the sun that its upper atmosphere only gets 1% of its rays. Due to its reflection, Titan's surface receives only 0.1% of the sun's light. Hugens compares this amount of illumination to photographing an asphalt parking lot at dusk. Despite Titan's darkness, only an oxygen mask and a warm blanket are necessary to stroll on its surface. Titan has an average temperature of minus 180 degrees Celsius. There is no melting, evaporation or sublimation of Titan's water. So, why do clouds occasionally form on Titan? Because the clouds are not composed of water ice, Titan can experience methane precipitation. Due to Titan's warmth, methane is liquid. Methane has a freezing point of minus 182.5 degrees centigrade and a boiling point of minus 161.5 degrees centigrade. Scientists are enthusiastic about the prospect of hydrocarbon lakes and seas on Titan's surface due to its high temperature and surface pressure. If lakes exist on this moon, they have never been observed on any other moon besides Earth. One of Cassini Hugens's main goals was to discover what was behind that thick atmosphere. Hugens's probe was supposed to go into Titan's atmosphere and land on the planet's surface. Titan was given its name after its discovery by an astronomer in 1655. During the design phase, it was even contemplated that it could end up in the ocean. After nearly three hours of freefall, the spacecraft descended on Titan's solid surface and released its parachute. Hugens landed on what seemed to be a lake bed that had dried up, indicating the presence of extinct methane lakes. Images of the surface reveal that these rocks resemble pebbles found in rivers and lakes on Earth. According to Cassini's satellite research, the south pole of Titan still contains methane lakes. Eventually, it was discovered that Cassini had observed the lake referred to as Ontario Larcus. Its cousin in North America, Lake Ontario, is 20% smaller. Yet, its coastline is vast at 15,000 square kilometers. The waves have damaged a beach's smoothness. On Titan's western side, a river and delta hint that liquid hydrocarbons flow down the higher plains to the lake and deposit in the delta. 
The depth of the interior lacus ranges from 40 centimeters to 3 meters. Almost definitely, the deepest point is more profound than 7 meters. On the radar map of this lake created by Cassini, no waves were more prominent than 3 millimeters. Hence, the surface would seem vitreous. If the liquid is exceptionally viscous, there may be more giant waves, but the day the observations were made was most likely quiet. Due to Titan's atmosphere's density and gravity, its waves should be more intense than Earth's. The North Pole of the Moon suffered a 15-year winter. During the parallax mission, Cassini discovered a fresh lunar lake. Jim Pollock's surface reflected sunlight into Cassini's field of view like a mirror. During additional observations, Cassini discovered evidence of moving liquid on Titan through rivers leading to a lake. Ligeia Mari is the second largest lake in the northern polar region of Titan. With a surface area of 126,000 square kilometers, it is more significant than Lake Superior on Earth. This lake contains some shallow places. The average depth is significantly more significant compared to Ontario. The lake's depths might reach more than 200 meters in some sections. The lake is surrounded by several islands and fed by numerous rivers. Cassini made a peculiar remark regarding the Magic Isle. It is distinguished by the development and disappearance of an island-like formation. According to one theory, when the lake warmed during the spring moon, debris bubbles or surface ice may have risen to the surface. Experts are still perplexed about what occurred here, but hypotheses include lake debris, bubbles, and subsurface ice rising to the surface. Kraken Lake is Titan's largest lake, covering 400,000 square kilometers. The lake mimics Earth since it is divided into two substantial portions. The Rock of Gibraltar is another name for Gibraltar. It is known as the Kraken's Throat due to the lake's size and tidal strength. Due to the one-meter tide change, this strait may contain powerful currents and even whirlpools. Kraken Mare is more profound than Ontario lakes, but only 170 meters deep. The lakes on Titan's surface are well known, but what other fascinating features can be discovered there? There is a multitude of them. A cryovolcano is a volcano that is frozen. Titan's surface is geologically active because the planet is less than 100 million years old. Although some data suggest that tidal interactions with Saturn may trigger tectonic activity on the Moon, the Moon's thick ice crust makes this unlikely. Very likely, the process that generates methane in the atmosphere is responsible for the regeneration of the surface. It is becoming more intriguing now. Even though it is scorching, magma that rises from the Earth freezes effectively. Earth's magma is carbon dioxide, but Titan's magma is water and ammonia. Because the water-ammonia mixture is less viscous than lava, it also freezes and replenishes the Earth's surface as it descends to the ground. The effect is that it flows further than lava on Earth. Volcanoes are higher than mountains on Earth. Hence, they will never reach their maximum potential. Titan's atmosphere obstructs specific cryovolcanoes, which makes Sutra Patera in the southern hemisphere the most likely choice. The dome of Titan and the world's most enormous bottomless pit are represented in this image, magnified by a factor of 10. This would have required a considerable amount of force to investigate. It is being monitored despite the appearance that it is not running. Titan's lava is comparable to filthy ice due to the presence of water and other minerals. The landing of fusions on Titan was bumpy and shaky, yet we have an approximation of the surface's appearance. Soft, wet sand, as described by scientists. On the contrary, it is comparable to snow with a thin crust. Even if the snow is frozen, you should try to walk on it. Solid surfaces require attention when approached. 
In contrast, if you step too heavily, you will sink significantly. It is presumed that Titan is comparable. Like the Rockies in North America, the highest mountains on Titan are ridged. Moreover, cryovolcanoes could occur along these ridge bands. Mythically, Three Months is one of Titan's mountain ranges, measuring 3,337 meters in height. Earth is inspected from space using infrared cameras. There are numerous gorges, valleys and dunes on Titan, and huge mountains are supposed to be coated in methane snow. These vast expanses of black earth are also clearly visible. Before the landing of the Hugens probe on Shangri-La, these black patches were considered seas. Titan and Earth are comparable in numerous ways. Scientists believe that Titan provides a picture of what early Earth may have seemed, albeit substantially colder. These are now black mineral formations that resemble the Namibia desert on Earth, where they exist as windswept dunes in select regions. These may have been seas in the past. I hope that the concept of Titan having its own mission becomes a reality one day. Cassini performed brilliantly, but it was never designed to orbit Titan, and its mission ended. Incredible images of Pluto depict a singular phenomenon. In 2006, NASA sent the New Horizons spacecraft to Pluto, the eighth planet in our solar system, to learn more about it. After nine years of travel, New Horizons became the first spacecraft to visit Pluto's faraway planet. The probe is currently 50 astronomical units from Earth. That is about 7,500 billion kilometers. Scientists continue to analyze the data collected during the Pluto flyby. Recent research indicates that Pluto is alive and not as tranquil as it may look. However, how did astronomers get to this conclusion? What anomalous feature did they observe in the photos the New Horizons probe provided? More importantly, does this provide evidence for the existence of life on Pluto? Pluto is an icy planet with a carbon monoxide and nitrogen ice core. It was the first object discovered in the Kuiper Belt, and is still the most significant known body in that region. In the 1990s, when additional objects of equal size were found in the Kuiper Belt, Pluto's status as a planet was questioned. 2006 saw Pluto classified as a dwarf planet by the International Astronomical Union. Despite this, it remains a human exploration goal. Contrarily, the photos from New Horizons have uncovered something surprising and previously unseen on any other planet in the solar system. In contrast to the rest of the planet, Pluto's surface is devoid of asteroid or meteor impact craters, as seen in photographs of its surface. Also, there were no signs of plate tectonic activity, which is needed for mountains to form on Earth. These signs suggest that a geological change, most likely a recent volcanic eruption, caused this surface to form. The last two billion years seem like a very long time. However, this event is brief and may be current in the cosmic timescale. Pluto's volcanic features, which include two peaks towering above the dwarf planet's surface, have long confused planetary scientists. The first is the Wright Mons mountain range. This surface object is approximately 150 kilometers wide, with a bulge that rises over 5 kilometers above the surface and a depression that spans about 50 kilometers. The second feature, Picard Mons, reaches around 7 kilometers in height and 225 kilometers in width. Even though Pluto's diameter is only one-sixth that of Earth, the overall volume of this volcano is comparable to that of Hawaii's Moana Loa, one of our planet's most colossal volcanoes. When the New Horizons mission flew by Pluto in July 2015, these large surface structures were discovered near the southwest edge of the Sputnik Planitia ice sheet, the lighter region to the left of Pluto's famous heart-shaped feature. 
This sheet is characterized by a thousand kilometer wide impact crater and folds and rises that resemble wrinkles on a smooth ice layer. This region also contains numerous volcanic domes, the majority of which tend to converge into a single enormous dome. Experts argued that the development of such a landscape must have been fueled by multiple eruption sites positioned near each other, and possibly the material released during the resultant cryovolcanic eruptions coated the entire region with layers of ice. Detailed analysis also reveals that the surface material in this region is primarily water and ice rather than nitrogen or methane ice, as is prevalent in younger parts of the planetary surface. And this increases the probability of volcanic activity. To be active, volcanoes must be propelled by a constant heat source. On Earth, for instance, volcanism is primarily powered by radioactive decay within the planet's interior. This heat could be produced by gravitational interactions between massive neighboring objects in different situations. It is the fundamental reason for the volcanism on Io. Nonetheless, both circumstances might be improved in terms of Pluto. None of the planet's neighbors creates sufficient gravitational and tidal forces to warm its interior. Moreover, the amount of rocky material within Pluto's core must be increased for radiation to produce heat. Pluto's typical surface temperature is roughly minus 240 degrees Celsius, and it has a rock-like, hard, frozen surface that cannot melt quickly so far from the Sun, even with other heat sources. So, where is this heat emanating from? Given all the data, the only possible hypothesis is that the dwarf planet still has excess heat from its formation, most likely in a deep ocean beneath its frozen crust. Similar seas exist on other ice-covered planets in the solar system, including Saturn's moon insulators and Europa, the moon of Jupiter. In addition, insulators have exhibited consistent cryovolcanism by ejecting rigid material into space and refilling one of Saturn's rings. But, except for Pluto, this is the only place in the solar system that has been found with vast stacks of icy volcanoes that stretch across a field and erupt to keep the icy surface fresh. But remember that New Horizons only performed a flyby and observed the region for one day. Thus, it remains to be seen if Pluto's cryovolcanism is active, or if the unusual ice volcanoes have become dormant. It improves the possibility of detecting a liquid ocean if it is still active. Who knows? Maybe even its existence. Moon Io. Ice and Fire. Jupiter's Galilean satellite Io is a planetary body that is so hostile that it is nearly incomprehensible. This frozen planet has a thin, unstable atmosphere, a surface temperature of minus 130 degrees Celsius, and lava lakes that boil at temperatures higher than Earth's. Moreover, radiation is abundant everywhere, and the surface is frozen. It would be tough to live there despite being crisscrossed by more than 400 active calderas. Io is a volcanically active land, a volcanic land. It is unmatched in the entire solar system. Before discovering Io's lava eruptions in 1979, people believed Jupiter's moons were inert and dead. Since then, we've been investigating this distant world to see what it has in joint with the fifth planet. Our findings also indicate that Io is a nightmare. If portrayed literally, Hell may resemble Io, the third largest satellite of Jupiter. Io has a diameter of 1,821 kilometers, making it even more prominent than the Moon. The Moon is one of the five most significant bodies in the solar system. Not its size makes Io hellish, but the fact that its surface is the most volcanically active in the solar system. On Io there are violent extremists. With over 400 volcanoes, Io resembles Earth from billions of years ago. Lava jets explode across hundreds of kilometers here. 
When magma oozes, we have never recorded a surface temperature greater than 1,650 degrees Celsius. Yet Io is not all hellfire and brimstone. Because of its distance from the sun, it is also coated with ice. Io's surface temperature is approximately minus 130 degrees Celsius, translating to very cold in Fahrenheit. Although this moon is warmer than most Jovian satellites, it is highly chilly with a thick layer of sulfur dioxide frost covering unburned portions of its surface. Our solar system's fog is believed to give planets distinctive hues, including green, yellow, red and purple. On Earth, sometimes bizarre hues can be observed surrounding volcanoes. Because the surface of Io is renowned for its vivid pastel hues, scientists anticipate a similar explanation. The Voyager crew famously compared enormous sulphide deposits to mouldy pizza. Nevertheless, even if these Io photographs are appealing, they will only last briefly. Wildfires continue to ravage the landscape. Moreover, the surface was among the youngest yet observed on a celestial body being at least a few million years younger than the surface of Mars, which is approximately three or four billion years old. Ganymede and Callisto look like giant periods, yet Io is constantly in flux. My favourite aspect of the show has always been witnessing the younger sister's transformation. Despite appearances, Io is just young on the surface, Io may have arisen before any of the other Galilean moons in the distant past, before Europa was even a wicked gleam in Jupiter's eye, according to a 2020 study by Caltech professor Konstantin Batygin. Ice ages are not the only cause. Regarding this, persistent rumours exist. Underneath all of this ice and fire is a captivating secret. Many space-age individuals believe there is a subterranean magma ocean beneath the Earth, although it is more likely that there are many liquid-filled pockets as well. In addition to extreme temperatures and catastrophic eruptions, Io lacks all elements except sulfur dioxide, so we cannot conduct in-person tests there. The projected surface pressure of Io is one billionth that of Earth. This vulnerability has peculiar side consequences. On its 42-hour orbit, the Io periodically loses sight of the Sun, obscuring our distant star's gentle warmth. Snow falls from its lower atmosphere when it freezes. Most snow melts upon leaving Io. It is considerably more enjoyable when the portions are frozen. Io's peculiar sand dunes are believed to result from interactions between lava and frozen sulfur dioxide. You now consider it to be a nightmare. It has never been a desirable area for us to reside. This is the time to delve further into both. Thus far, we have barely scratched the surface. Are ice volcanoes visible despite the high radiation levels, and what makes them so unique? Among all of Galileo's moons, the orbit of Io is the closest to Jupiter. Jupiter's minor moons are closer to the planet than its four major satellites. Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto are responsible for 99.9% .9 of Jupiter's mass. In other words, Io is sufficiently close to its host and substantial enough to pose serious complications. Io's orbit takes it through what NASA calls powerful magnetic lines of force as it crosses Jupiter's magnetic field from only 422,000 kilometers. Despite this, Io's interaction with these forces produces vast electricity. According to NASA, Io's interactions with Jupiter can generate up to 400,000 volts of cannon energy, which travels through Jupiter's magnetic field lines and causes tremendous lightning storms. Because of Jupiter's rapid rotation, its magnetic field flits like a child on a malfunctioning amusement park ride. This repeatedly passes Io, removing up to 1,000 kilograms of material from the Moon. Each second, 
the material is ionized and added to a vast swirling cloud of radiation. It is incredibly cool, yet this is what occurs when Io leaves the plasma cloud. Hubble and Juno have captured unusual blue auroras near Jupiter's polar regions. The unusual light show is caused by the ionized particles leaving Io and becoming stuck, circling around Jupiter's magnetic field. Several particles have escaped, causing Jupiter's magnetosphere to double in size. It is even more remarkable when you realize how small Io is compared to its enormous space. But this is not a one-sided relationship, unlike a large but delicate lover. Jupiter returns the same amount it receives from Io's volcanoes. Given that we inhabit a world with volcanoes, Io's mountains of fiery death are presumably caused by the same reasons that cause eruptions in Hawaii. In contrast, the reality is quite different. Jupiter's gravity causes all these eruptions. More precisely, Jupiter's gravity interacts with the gravity of the other Galilean moons. Do you recall what we said regarding the mass of Jupiter's four major satellites? Because they are sufficiently big, they have intense gravity, and because they orbit at separate velocities, the pulling of this gravity tends to impact Io independently. Europa and Ganymede pull on their sister as she orbits Jupiter, desperately attempting to pull her out. Jupiter's gravity forces Io to lose its shape due to the yanking. The moon might be dragged 100 meters into the atmosphere as it enters resonance. We observe a comparable phenomenon on Earth. When the moon's gravity pulls on the oceans, sea levels rise, resulting in 18-meter-high tides. When Io swivels past its siblings, its crust grows by a factor of five. This straining results in internal friction. Very high temperatures cause friction to transform solid rock into lava. Ice volcanoes conceal a secret. Is there a reason for their abundance? Why are they so powerful and capable of spewing nearly 500 kilometers into the air? Scientists require assistance in comprehending the positioning of Io's volcanoes. After discovering the process, the moon's eruptions can only be partially explained. Following the hypothesis of tidal heating, they should be clustered at the poles. However, this must be corrected. In addition, it cannot account for the abrupt and powerful eruptions that appear to double the brightness of the entire planet. All these mysteries contribute to Io's allure, which is amplified by its alien magma, which flows quicker and covers more area than any terrestrial lava could, and its enormous caldera, which might swallow a country the size of El Salvador. The greatest Loki Patera hole is a lake of molten fire that renews itself every 400 days in a cycle of light and darkness. Interesting. And though all of this is true, Io isn't only about what's happening right now, because an equally intriguing story unfolds on this distant moon. This is the account of humanity's contact with the exploding satellite of Jupiter. Galileo Galilei revolutionized astronomy on January 16, 1610, when he observed Jupiter with a handmade telescope. By the beginning of the 17th century, humanity's understanding of the sky depended on ancient knowledge. The number of recognized planets is maintained at six. Before discovering the moon's orbit around another celestial body, severe and influential individuals believed that the universe revolved around the Earth rather than the Sun. On January 7, 1610, Galileo claimed himself as the first person in history to observe one of Jupiter's moons. It was vital as he continued his Jupiter research the following evening. In addition to the fifth planet, Galileo also observed three small stars. These little stars are designated Io, Europa, and Ganymede. On the other hand, the astronomer believed nothing odd was occurring at the time. 
his epochal discovery only occurred once he had observed for several nights. Even as they reached Jupiter, the three stars travelled across the heavens in a straight line. Galileo quickly determined that these stars orbit Jupiter, meaning they are not stars. Two months later, in Venice, the Sideris Nuncio witnessed the publication of the Starry Message, one of history's most significant scientific works. The novel begins with the epic assertion that four planets are revolving around Jupiter at extraordinary speeds, at varying distances from the star, and for varying lengths of time. Before the author discovered them, this was the first time anyone had heard of them. On the journey, she was travelling with her siblings. According to the official account, this is the case. At least two contradictory claims, one plausible and the other less so, dispute Galileo's claim that he was the first to see Io. In late December 1609, a month before Galileo, the German astronomer Simon Marius published his book claiming to have observed all four satellites. The German and Italian calendars were distinct at the time. Marius asserts that he discovered the moons in November, although his earliest observations date back to January 9, 1610, a day after Galileo. In contrast, the second charge is more difficult to verify or disprove. Gandhi, a Chinese astronomer, noticed a dim red star alongside Jupiter in 365 BC, which some have hypothesized could be Io. Regardless of who discovered the moons first, the issue remains unanswered. Nonetheless, Galileo obtained the right to publish his findings, thus naming all four moons, 16, 10, and 9. And Galileo was not an idiot. He christened them Medici and planets. His backers included the Medici dynasty. Even though the initial name was collective, Io symbolized Jupiter. It was meant as a tribute to the four Medici brothers. This is how we will immortalize Galileo's supporters in the heavens. Unfortunately, this was an exception. The discovery of new moons around Saturn at the midpoint of the 19th century rendered numbering systems obsolete. As Saturn's satellites were given legendary names such as Titan and Enceladus, scientists began questioning why Jupiter's moons were named after deceased Florentines. They began by generating new names and locating them in the works of Simon Marius, who believed he was the first to observe satellites. He believed he named them after the legendary goddesses Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, who were ecstatic over Jupiter's desire. In the 19th century, this was an acceptable practice. They accepted Maria's plan, but they decided to recognize him instead because it seemed wrong to steal Galileo's opponents' names without crediting him. As a result, the four enormous planets that orbit Jupiter have been given the name Galilean moons. Between the renaming of Aeis and the launch of the first probe to the Jovian system, there were few noticeable changes over the decades. Possibly the only observation is that Io had more siblings than was previously believed. Edward Emerson Barnard discovered a new Jovian moon for the first time since Galileo's time on September 9, 1892. Twelve years later, when the Himalayas were discovered, Barnard's accomplishment became less impressive. With over 80 known moons around Jupiter, it is even less likely that Io knowledge will increase. Before launching probes into orbit, it had to reach a crucial technological benchmark. By the middle of the 20th century we had arrived. There has been a dramatic shift in understanding Io over the past six years. In 1792, our moon was considered lifeless and inanimate. Therefore, Io appeared as a pinpoint light next to Jupiter. 1973 marked the first time we measured Pioneer 10 as it went by. In December 1975, a year later, Pioneer 11 captured its first photograph. 
In contrast, the events of 1979 would shatter everything. In 1979, Voyager 1, which had considerably more advanced cameras than Pioneer 11, sped beyond the solar system. The pictures were sufficiently distinct for scientific analysis. As these images were transmitted back to Earth, they revealed a sight no one anticipated. Linda Morabito oversaw examining the stream of photographs that morning when she manually analysed one of the Channel 4 photographs, which would soon be mechanised but was performed manually in 1979. The strange hump on the moon's surface may have resulted from image distortion. Fortunately for Morabito, this met his needs. The bulge was a gigantic plume, a lava cascade bursting into the Ionian sky from a volcano. Unknowingly, Morabito discovered the first evidence of extraterrestrial volcanism. We felt we knew everything there was to know about Jupiter's moons when we realized that one of them was not a cold, uninteresting rock. As if this distant spacecraft had miraculously turned from a dot to a potential sighting. In this geologically volatile region, strange and lovely things are possible. Thus, NASA's decision to relaunch in October 1989 was not unexpected. From 1995 to 2003, the Galileo probe conducted a comprehensive study of Jupiter and its major moons. We learned more about Io, a chaotic volcanic planet with a constantly changing surface, because we often flew by it. Even though Galileo visited Io only six times, we were the first to observe the moon of ice and fire up close. Cassini visited Saturn briefly in 2000, while en route to the planet. In 2007, New Horizons checked in again while collecting a gravity assist booster for its journey to Pluto. Currently, Juno is in orbit around Jupiter. Io produces ancient radio waves which Juno has been studying since 2016 and will be analysed in at least two more flybys to collect further data towards the end of 2023 and the start of 2024. Despite this, there have yet to be dedicated expeditions or individual probes dispatched to Io's hot moon to uncover its secrets. Even so, scientists have tried. The story of our repeated failures to gain a comprehensive understanding of Io even with the best intentions, even the most fundamental class discovery efforts require hundreds of millions of dollars. The agency is restricted to financing a limited number of activities and prioritizes projects. The inability to visit Io is lamentable. When NASA requested more concept research work in 2007, the concept of a dedicated voyage to Io became controversial. On the other side, the Applied Physics Laboratory of Johns Hopkins University was able to sell its mission proposal to the Discovery Program, which supported the Dawn mission to Ceres. The outcome of this pitch was Io Volcano Observer, or IVO. Due to Jupiter's gravitational tug-of-war with Europa and Ganymede, we plan to use a probe to investigate why Io is so volcanically active. Ivo would fly close to the lava-covered surface of the moon ten times. When the probe descended, it would acquire high-resolution images of Io's surface. Ivo captured stunning close-up images of Io's volcanoes by timing its flybys with moments of peak activity. Only some of the footage and images of the volcano would be incredible. On the other side, the videos are the best part. Ivo sought signs of early volcanism on Earth billions of years ago and uncovered what lay beneath the surface of Io. At its peak, the project offered a glimpse into the early history of Earth and Mars in the solar system. Sadly, NASA was not content. The concept failed to make the 2010 discovery shortlist and languished for the next decade. 
A modified version was one of the 2013 Decadal Survey's suggested projects. Every decade, enumerate the most astounding feats that planetary scientists believe humankind could achieve. When a project is included in the Decadal, it is proceeding correctly. Even if it did exist, Ivo hesitated to provide it again if denied. The concept was selected as one of four finalists in 2015, alongside two Venus missions and a hypothetical expedition to Titan. This glimmer disappeared instantly. In June 2021, NASA announced funding for Da Vinci and Veritas. Despite their proximity, Ivo needed help to generate sufficient passion. Uncertainty exists as to whether the project will be repitched. No matter how terrible the circumstances are, we cannot act empathetically. Yet returning to Io, a universe with so much depth, variety and intrigue makes us sad. Our solar system contains only a handful of confirmed active volcanoes, including Io. Volcanoes and cryovolcanoes are suspected on Venus, Ceres and Europa. Nothing compares to the intensity of Io's atmosphere. As NASA focuses on ice planets that could potentially support life, even the most miniature Krakatoa explosions would appear to be nothing more than a blip. In addition to frozen water and subterranean oceans, countless other themes merit investigation. Moons are not simply enjoyable due to their size. Nothing in the solar system can compare to Io, because it is one of the cosmos's oldest and most fascinating objects. Sure, there is a world of ice, yet the fire illuminates our skies, a location we hope to return to one day. A stellar discovery has broken all previously held records in astronomy. 2022 was an excellent year for extragalactic astronomy. First, scientists spotted the most distant galaxy ever discovered in the universe. The distance between the nearest star and this galaxy is 13.5 billion light-years. The distance between this galaxy and Earth is approximately 100 million light-years farther than previously believed. Secondly, astronomers have discovered the farthest known solitary star in the cosmos. This star, Arundel, may be a member of a particular star population. How were astronomers able to locate a single star so far out in space after decades of searching? How large is this star relative to the Sun? What will we learn as the James Webb Space Telescope concentrates on Arundel? Icarus, a blue supergiant, was the most distant star known before Arundel. Due to the universe's expansion, the proper distance to this star is 14.4 billion light-years, not 9.34 billion. Arundel is considerably further away than Icarus, with a transit distance of 12.9 billion light-years and a proper distance of 28 billion light-years. Around 4 billion years ago, when the universe was approximately 4 billion years old, Icarus occurred. Arundel existed throughout the first 900 million years following the Great Bang. This star predates both the Sun and the Earth by 8.2 billion years. The most miniature objects previously discovered at this distance were star clusters in distant galaxies. In contrast, Arundel is the first solitary star discovered at such a great distance the Hubble Space Telescope accidentally found this star. A foreground galaxy cluster gravitationally magnified the star's parent galaxy, which Hubble initially discovered. Significant astronomical events, such as galaxy clusters, affect the fabric of space-time. As the light from the foreground celestial bodies approaches these vast objects, it bends. Because of gravitational lensing, the Sunrise Arc was named after the background galaxy that housed Arundel. In contrast, the scientists observed a bright object poised on the galaxy's periphery. Sources of light and distant galaxies result from high-energy events such as novas, 
supernovae, and black hole-caused tidal disturbances. These are transients whose luminosity varies over time. But Hubble scans indicated that this object's brilliance remained constant for around three and a half years, leading scientists to believe it was a gravitationally expanded brilliant star in the sunrise arc. According to the research team, Arundel has at least 50 times the mass of the Sun and millions of times the Sun's luminosity, making it comparable to the most massive stars. An enormous galaxy cluster acts as a natural magnifier between Arundel and us, allowing us to observe such a brilliant, enormous star from such a vast distance. In addition, the galaxy cluster's enormity alters the fabric of space producing a robust natural magnifying glass that distorts and drastically amplifies the light from distant objects behind it. Given the age and projected mass of the star, Arundel's discovery was only conceivable because the star was in the correct location at the proper time. Perhaps the entity no longer exists. Prominent stars like Arundel exhaust their nuclear fuel significantly more rapidly than smaller, intermediate-sized stars. Thus, their average lifespan is a few million years compared to 10 billion years for sun-like medium-sized stars and trillions of years for red dwarfs. As a result, Arundel could have perished in catastrophic explosions billions of years ago. The significance of the Arundel discovery is that it may be the first detection of a population of three stars for which astronomers have been searching for decades. Hydrogen and helium, the two most significant chemical elements, were generated during primordial nucleosynthesis. As a result, the metallicity of the first generation of stars, often known as population three stars, was low. A metal in astronomy is any substance other than hydrogen and helium. According to scientists, most of the three stars have died and the few remaining are dim and difficult to view. Most candidates have been discovered in galaxies that have been gravitationally lensed. Arundel's spectral classification is unknown, unlike Icarus, a blue supergiant star. Possible binary star system scientists anticipate that Arundel will be amplified for many years and potent observatories such as the James Webb Space Telescope will be utilized to assess its features. Webb's exceptional sensitivity to infrared light is necessary to learn more about this distant star, whose light is red-shifted to longer infrared wavelengths as the cosmos expands at an accelerating rate. If you could figure out exactly how bright Arundel is and how hot its surface is, you could figure out what kind of star it is and where it is in its life cycle. Astronomers also expect to find that the Sunrise Arc galaxy doesn't have any of the heavy metals that will be made by stars in the future. It strongly indicates that Arundel is a rare and colossal metal dwarf star. The Hubble Space Telescope which primarily operates in the optical and ultraviolet parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, was used to make this finding. Its mid-infrared capabilities can go back 500 million years to the Big Bang, whereas Webb can see 200 million years further back in time. Approximately 150 million years after the cosmos reached a temperature of 60 Kelvin at the beginning of this deliquescence epoch, the first stars arose. Webb is anticipated to surpass the distance record set by the Hubble Space Telescope, which would be fantastic. The hunt for the first stars and galaxies has long been considered the holy grail of astronomy. The discovery of the earliest generation of stars could help us comprehend star creation and corroborate the Big Bang model's predictions. Richard Feynman says that the most surprising thing about astronomy is that stars are made of the same atoms as Earth. Therefore, searching for them is analogous to searching for our own ancestors. Callisto's Most Enthralling Mysteries Galilean, the largest moon of Jupiter, is one of the best-known moons in the solar system. 
one of the four receives minimal consideration. Even though Callisto is the third largest moon known to humans, most people must become familiar with it. Is the world dull because so little is known about it? Contrary to what most people think, we know much more than we think, which is fascinating. The Jovian system is divided into numerous categories. Callisto is the third largest moon in our solar system, measuring 4,820 kilometers in diameter. Even though its diameter is only 58 kilometers smaller than Mercury's, its mass is only one-third of Mercury's, which means it has less gravity and is less dense. It takes Ganymede 17 Earth days to orbit Jupiter at a distance of 1.9 million kilometers, considerably farther than the other three Galilean moons. Even though Callisto is far from Jupiter, it is tightly locked, which means it always faces Jupiter. The moons are therefore not locked in orbital resonance. According to us, this was only sometimes the case. Callisto's atmosphere consists primarily of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Even though oxygen has not been identified, due to the atmosphere's thinness, molecules do not collide. After four years, the atmosphere should be pulled away due to atmospheric loss mechanisms. By sublimating carbon dioxide surface ice, the Callisto crust replenishes atmospheric particles. Callisto's surface is almost 4 billion years old, making it one of the oldest planets in the solar system. The variegated surface of Callisto catches the eye immediately. Unlike any other object we've examined, its surface is studded with impact craters. Possible outcomes include saturation. At this moment, fresh and ancient craters will overlap. Only the containers on Callisto change their appearance over time. Why is Callisto's surface so old compared to other celestial bodies? It is possible to obliterate all signs of past attacks on geologically active worlds like Earth. Because so much occurs on Earth's surface, it has one of the least generated surfaces in the solar system. Its characteristics include tectonic plates, volcanism, aquatic vegetation, and human activity. As a result, the ground deteriorates, erodes, and rises. Because of tidal forces, some of Jupiter's moons, like Europa and Io, have fewer craters on their surfaces. The first three Galilean moons in orbital resonance are Io, Europa, and Ganymede. These moons exert a mutual gravitational pull. Each time Ganymede orbits Jupiter, Europa rounds twice and Io orbits four times. The orbital resonance exerts tidal pressure on these moons, preventing them from entering a totally circular orbit. As the moon orbits Jupiter, its gravitational force fluctuates in strength. The production of tides elongates the moon's surface and warms its interior. This is a required action for Callisto. The absence of volcanism and plate tectonics has preserved Callisto's surface for millions of years. Callisto's lack of geological activity and weak tidal forces further distinguish it. The entire area of the island is devoid of mountains. Callisto was most likely a frozen ocean world at the beginning of the solar system. Except for the meteor shower, it has remained unchanged since then. Since some tallest buildings are scary, let's look at some people who designed them. Asgard is the second largest impact crater on Callisto, measuring 1,600 kilometers in diameter. Valhalla is a 3,800 kilometer diameter multi ringed impact crater in our solar system. These craters, which include more rings than any other crater, distinguish Callisto visually. A strong enough impactor could have broken through the thin crust and made the craters freeze again. You'll see their speckled appearance when you zoom in on these middle sections. It appears that the contrast between brilliant knobs and darker planes is significant. 
The plain's surface is far less cratered than the rest of Callisto, which makes sense if it was refrozen two billion years ago. The split in the crust was most likely caused by a concentric failure of the brittle shell of the moon. Intriguingly, these knobs may still be seen within the rings. How do the knobs operate? These are the ruined remains of the millions of crater rims that once surrounded Callisto. Over time, small meteor strikes have weakened them, or the ice is slowly melting. They are brighter than the lower planes because, over time, meteorite and micrometeorite fragments have rolled down the knobs, exposing the pure ice on top. Smaller impact craters are incredibly fascinating to view due to their rarity. Impact craters on Callisto are shallower than those on our moon. For instance, the leaf and impact structures are more comprehensive than 100 kilometers. Nonetheless, its depth is barely 600 meters. The impact are likely broke up before it hit, so the shock and effect were spread. The surface may have leveled out due to subsequent, more extensive hits in the vicinity. Even though it is more than a billion years old, the ejector from the impact site can still be seen. Some craters, such as Haar Crater, demonstrate that the moon remains unchanging. Generally, a vast dome in the centre significantly impacts the surrounding planets. There are a few concentric circles and an erased peak in the center. This is the situation on the moon. Yet, some enormous craters on Callisto suggest the opposite. You can find tinder here. Instead of a peak, there is a hole at the summit's center. Does there exist a rationale for Callisto's peculiar craters? Callisto's crust is more than brittle and thin. A salty ocean or soft ice lies beneath. It is estimated that the crust is 80 to 150 kilometers thick. Galileo studied the Galilean moons and spent several years in Jupiter's neighborhood. Galileo thought that the fact that Jupiter's magnetic field couldn't reach Callisto meant that there was a highly conductive layer under the surface. This cannot have occurred because of ice or silicates. Even if the ice layer is not partially melted, conductive effects can still happen if gradients are kept below the ice. According to statistics, it has a silicate core with a radius of around 600 kilometers. Like Callisto, can other icy planets with water mantles beneath their surface support life? Existence as we know it requires liquid water and energy. Due to the ocean of liquid water beneath Callisto's surface, it receives very little heat from our sun while being almost 800 million kilometers from it. Moreover, there are no tides to aid. If this subterranean ocean exists, radioactive substances can only heat it. Hence, you will be able to verify something if you visit Callisto. Because their vents eject water directly from their underground oceans, we can examine the habitability of moons like Europa and Enceladus without visiting their oceans. Callisto has no of these vents, so scientists must drill through the crust to find them. Because of these factors, scientists feel that Callisto needed improved environmental conditions to exist. On the other hand, Callisto should be addressed. Callisto would be a great place to start exploring the solar system in the future. Callisto orbits Jupiter at a speed of 1.9 million kilometers per hour, making its environment more conducive to the human investigation than Jupiter's innermost moons. Water ice on Callisto is also necessary for propellant production and human survival. It is also feasible to breathe oxygen if hydrogen and oxygen are separated. Due to Callisto's geological stability, constructing structures on the surface is relatively simple, and because there are no significant mountains or bottomless pits, traveling across Callisto is faster, easier, and more efficient. On our way to the outer parts of the solar system, we should look at the inner Jovian system from a safe distance. 
Due to Jupiter's low gravity, a close flypast would assist in launching from Callisto. This is a slight chance, but it could happen if we become a species that can travel to space. Although Galileo examined Callisto beautifully during his few flybys, substantial knowledge gaps remain. If all goes well, Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer will launch in 2022 and reach Jupiter and its three largest moons, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa, by 2030. Throughout this mission, ESA will fly close to Callisto multiple times. This mission could reveal the ocean floor. Can it support or sustain life? We have yet to consider posing these inquiries. Who knows what else we will discover regarding this lovely moon. Scientists have astonishingly discovered an ocean-covered super-Earth. One of the main reasons there is life on Earth is because there is water on the surface. According to evidence, at least 3.5 billion years ago, life on Earth began in the ocean. Water worlds are anticipated to be our best shot at discovering alien life. In the past three decades, astronomers have proven the existence of over 5,000 extrasolar planets. Recent additions to the list include a super-Earth with a global liquid ocean. How did scientists discover this distant exoplanet? How do they know it consists of a large ocean? Thirdly, and most importantly, how probable is life in this aquatic world? TOI-1452b is the identifying number. This exoplanet is approximately 100 light-years from Earth in the constellation Draco. TESS first alluded to the existence of the transiting exoplanet survey satellite operated by NASA. TESS has been utilizing the transit method to search for exoplanets in a region 400 times larger than that covered by the Kepler mission since its debut in 2018. The transit method is one of the most efficient techniques for discovering exoplanets. When a planet passes in front of its parent star in our line of sight, the parent star's light curve reveals a drop in luminosity. By analyzing a planet's orbit, astronomers can determine if it exists. The light curve can directly calculate parameters such as the planet's orbital period, mass, and size. Using the same technique, TESS detected TOI-1450 in a binary pair orbiting one of the red dwarfs. The object of interest for TESS is represented by TOI. In this case, the red dwarf star is involved. The target number in the catalogue is 1452, and the letter B denotes that the discovered planet is the first to be detected in proximity to that star. As a result, TOI-1452b is the first planet found in the TESS database of objects of interest orbiting the 1450th star. This signal dimmed in brightness every 11 days, as observed by TESS. This indicated that a planet may orbit one of the components of the binary dwarf system. The two binary stars are separated by a distance of 97 astronomical units. TESS perceives the Sun and Pluto as a single point of light, despite the distance between them being two and a half times greater than the distance between the Sun and Pluto. In this instance, though, ground-based data from Canada's Mont Megantic Observatory proved crucial. The observatory's optical camera resolved the two stars, revealing that the exoplanet orbited the two most conspicuous stars, TOI-1452. This image from the research report contains a visual binary partially resolved by the PESTO camera. Further observations made by a Japanese team supported this conclusion. After establishing the planet's existence, the next hurdle was to ascertain the planet's physical characteristics using observations. Many factors affect the quantity of the starlight dip. The most important aspect of a transiting globe is its size. By analysing the decrease in brightness reported by both stations, 
astronomers concluded that a super-Earth, roughly 1.67 times the size of Earth, orbited TOI 1452. In addition, because the signal revealed a periodic variation in brightness every 11 days, it is evident that the planet revolves around its host star in only 11 Earth days, in contrast to Earth, which completes one orbit around the star in around 365 days. Due to its shorter orbital period, I1452b orbits its star closely. Yet, the host star is significantly cooler and dimmer than the Sun. Thus, the planet lies within the star's temperate zone, where the temperature is suitable for liquid water, indicating that it is conducive to water-based life. This possibility increased my desire to learn more about the planet's characteristics. Thus, the mass of the Earth is the next essential quantity to compute. Astronomers use the radial velocity method for this purpose. When a planet orbits a star, they interact gravitationally according to this approach. In consequence, the star is not stationary. Instead, it moves in a small circle or ellipse and responds to smaller partners. A gravitational attraction. Such changes in a star's location alter its light spectrum as an observer perceives from a distance when it travels towards the observer. This spectrum appears relatively blue and shifted, whereas the spectrum of a distant star is red-shifted. The spectral analysis reveals the gravitational interaction between the two astronomical objects, and, consequently, the planet's mass. According to the research in TOI 1452b, the exoplanet's mass is 4.82 times that of Earth. The planet's density was also calculated using its mass and size. The density was unexpectedly 5.6 grams per cubic centimetre. This is close to the Earth's 5.5 grams per cubic centimetre density. Indeed, this increases the intrigue. The thickness of a body represents the quantity of matter contained in a particular volume. Hence, if a planet with roughly five times the mass of Earth, but only twice its size, has a comparable density to Earth, it must be composed of a lighter substance than Earth, which is composed of metals and minerals. To find an explanation, researchers modelled the inside of the exoplanet in this publication's graph. The hypothesized composition curves of several exoplanets correspond to their masses and radii. Several inner structure models from various studies were used to generate these curves. This graph shows that TOI 1452b is either a terrestrial planet with a thin hydrogen envelope or a water world with a rich interior of more than 25% water by mass. Less than 1% of the Earth's mass is water. If the models are accurate, the composition of TOI 1452b resembles that of Europa, a hypothetical moon orbiting Jupiter that has water. Suitable exoplanet candidates of this type have been anticipated for years, but this is the first time one has been discovered. Yet, it must be determined precisely what TOI 1452b consists of. This is where we expect Webb to prove useful. Webb can analyze in detail the fluctuations in the starlight spectrum caused by a planet's atmosphere. This allows it to indirectly examine the composition of an exoplanet's atmosphere. TOI 1452b is currently considered the best possibility for a water planet. However, we must wait to see what new information the James Webb Space Telescope uncovers about the exoplanet. Webb's precise atmospheric measurements could prove the existence of life on this distant planet. Scientists have found the most remote galaxy in the universe. But there's a catch. This snapshot depicts the furthest distant galaxy ever discovered to date. Even light took 13.5 billion years to reach us from that location. What, then, is the nature of this distant galaxy? Why do astronomers not comprehend it? 
Why do they intend to focus the James Webb Space Telescope in that region? The formation of the first stars and galaxies has long been regarded as the holy grail of astronomy. Yet, these galaxies are incredibly faint and redshifted to an extreme degree. Jean Z11 was the oldest and most distant known galaxy in the observable universe until 2022. 13.4 billion light years were required for the light to reach this galaxy. Scientists have identified a new galaxy approximately 100 million light years away from Gene Z11. It was given the designation HD1 and is situated in the constellation Sexton. The HD version, on the other hand, is a mystery unto itself. Secondly, the galaxy's red colour is due to redshift, which occurs when the light source moves away from us. The wavelength of the emitted light is lengthened. The intensity increases as one approach the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Because the universe is expanding, the galaxies in deep space appear redshifted. The more distant a galaxy is in deep space, the faster it moves away from us and the larger its redshift. Astronomers may use the redshift phenomenon to calculate the galaxy's distance from Earth. The light travel distance to HD1 is 13.5 billion light years. However, the actual distance, considering the universe's expansion, is 33.4 billion. So, discovering this distant galaxy was a challenging endeavor. Four giant optical and infrared telescopes, including the Subaru telescope, the Vista Telescope, the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope spent 1,200 hours watching. The group had to locate HD1 among more than 700,000 objects. While the HD version appears red, according to a detailed spectroscopic investigation, this galaxy is exceptionally bright in the ultraviolet section of the M spectrum. This indicates that some exciting occurrences are occurring in high definition. Nonetheless, scientists acknowledge that it takes time to determine what is occurring in a galaxy 13.5 billion light years away. That is equivalent to assuming a ship's nationality from its flag. It flies while the ship is ashore in a violent storm or dense fog. Colors and shapes of the flag are partially visible. Therefore, it is ultimately a time-consuming game of analysis and elimination of impossible situations. Yet the team believes that there are two possible explanations for the nature of this old galaxy. It might be an enormous starburst galaxy or a powerful quasar. How, then, do they justify their findings? What problems does each of these models possess? A starburst galaxy, or SFR for short, produces stars at an accelerated rate. The star formation rate is crucial in galactic and extragalactic astronomy. A starburst is a stage in a galaxy's evolution that can occur for various regions. Even galactic interactions, such as those between the antenna galaxies, can cause a starburst. In the past 100 million years, these two galaxies have been merging, and as a result, the pace of star formation has increased dramatically. In this diagram, the blue region represents active star formation. Because high SFR rates brighten galaxies, astronomers determine the number of stars required to produce the required light. The answer was 100 per year. This is ten times the number of stars expected in a galaxy of this age. But there is a reason for this. The earliest generation of stars was considerably hotter and brighter than the current generation. If this is the case, we can observe the light of three stars composed primarily of hydrogen and helium. The second possibility is that a large quasar is responsible for the brightness. A quasar is the most powerful object in the cosmos. Its active galactic core contains a supermassive black hole that rapidly consumes the surrounding matter, and the resulting heat causes light to spread throughout the universe. 
The results of the team's computation of the size of the supermassive black hole required to match HD1's observed luminosity were unexpected. They discovered that the size of the black hole must be 100 million times that of the Sun. Given the time frame, that is a substantial amount of mass. Furthermore, this size of a black hole should not have arisen 330 million years after the Big Bang. It must have exploded from a gigantic seed if it is a quasar. Existing black hole models face a significant challenge as a result. With its enhanced infrared capabilities, the team anticipates that future research with the James Webb Space Telescope, a device designed to peer into the early universe, will reveal the nature of this morning light. This Betelgeuse update from scientists is phenomenal. A well-known actor named Betelgeuse began to mysteriously decline in 2019. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star in the constellation Orion on its way out. It is so enormous that if it had existed in place of the Sun, its outer edge would have reached Jupiter's orbit. The supernova of this star is one of the most anticipated astronomical events. 1604 was the last time a supernova was observed in our galaxy. According to Kepler star data, however, the astonishing explosion remained visible during the day for over three weeks. Thus, enthusiasm for Betelgeuse's explosion is rather typical. The star Betelgeuse is classed as semi-variable. For 400 days it gradually brightens and darkens. Yet, Something unexpected occurred in the final month of 2019, when a December 2019 image of the star was compared to a January 2019 image. Its surface was observed to be significantly darker. By mid-February, the star had fallen to 35% of its initial brilliance, a magnitude more incredible than ever observed. Because of this peculiar behaviour, Many people hypothesized that Betelgeuse would shortly go supernova. Nonetheless, the dramatic dimming of the star remained unexplained, puzzling astronomers worldwide. Using ESO's giant telescope, a group of scientists continue to monitor Betelgeuse's luminosity. While the observations were made to explore theories in astronomy, by April 2020, the star had returned to its usual apparent brilliance. As observed from Earth, a substantial good region existed on its surface, or a cloud of dust developed right before the star. After months of inquiry, astronomers have finally determined the source of Betelgeuse's fading. Interestingly, both stated explanations turned out to be accurate. Researchers observed that a dust cloud partially veiled the star, causing it to diminish over time. This indicates that the significant dimming did not result from an impending supernova. Instead, there was a dust cloud at work. So where did this dust cloud come from, and how did it affect Betelgeuse's brightness? Please be patient. Massive gas bubbles within the star shift, contract and expand, causing the surface of stars like Betelgeuse to regularly change. Before the great dimming, it is claimed that Betelgeuse created a gigantic gas bubble that drifted away due to a decrease in temperature. As a result, a suitable location appeared on the star and the ejected gas condensed into concrete dust due to the temperature drop. Therefore, the brilliant spot on the surface initially made the star appear dimmer and then the dust cloud's condensation led to the star's rapid dimming. The mass of Betelgeuse is approximately 15 to 20 times that of the Sun. In its last phases, a star of this size may shortly explode as a supernova. When the sudden dimming happened, assuming that the star was about to explode in a spectacular supernova was not unreasonable. However, it was revealed that a cloud of dust and gas was to blame. Betelgeuse is located approximately 550 light-years away. This suggests that even the star's light takes 550 years to reach us. Hence, even if the star implodes immediately, 
we will not know for another 550 years. Alternatively, the supernova may have already occurred, but the light has yet to reach us. It is one of the most awaited astronomical events, and it will provide astronomers with a lot of knowledge on the birth and death of stars. The Earth is located at a safe distance from the supernova, so its lethal electromagnetic radiation will not damage life on Earth. Recent Mars statistics indicate that something peculiar is occurring there. Mars was not as silent as initially imagined. Instead, the red planet's surface is rumbling and moaning due to vigorous seismic activity. The planet is experiencing dynamic tremors, and molten lava may flow beneath the Martian crust. If suitable, it will modify our understanding of Mars's geodynamics and imply that volcanism on the red planet is plausible and occurs more frequently than anticipated. So what does this commotion signify? What effect will it have on our knowledge of the geology of Mars? Finally, how will this game-changing discovery affect our hunt for past and contemporary life on Mars? Mars was a hotspot for volcanism three to four billion years ago. During this period, it released enough volcanic debris from its interior to construct Olympus Mons one of our solar system's most significant volcanic structures. It is nearly three times the height of Mount Everest. Nevertheless, it was believed that most volcanism occurred only during this epoch. Isolated regions experienced minor eruptions as recently as three million years ago. A planet's magnetic field results from its inner activity. The absence of a global magnetic field on Mars enhances the argument that its interior is no longer active. In short, there is no evidence that Mars is still volcanically active. But 2018 marked the beginning of a new era in our exploration of Mars. NASA launched the InSight mission, which was designed to investigate the interior of Mars. The first direct evidence of earthquakes on Mars was found in the data from the lander's seismic tests. The onboard equipment identified 174 Mars earthquakes over 235 Martian days, or SOLs, even though the first tremor was insufficiently robust. Let's jump to the year 2022. InSight Lander has observed around 1300 earthquakes on Mars. A celestial body's tremors may reveal much about its internal makeup and activity. So that we can better comprehend what is occurring within Mars's stomach, researchers analyzed in detail a cluster of 20 newly reported earthquakes. According to statistics, most of the world's faults are not seismically active. In addition, the researchers discovered something intriguing. The tremors originated in an area known as Cerberus Fossae. It is a fractured section of the Earth named after the Hellhound of Hades a guardian of the underworld in Greek mythology. At this point, things become intriguing. This region contains landforms known as grubbin. The tectonic action here causes the fissures to open. As a result of this opening, crustal blocks slide down between the parallel ridges for faults. On the Cerberus's flanks, low-frequency seismic waves were observed while high-frequency tremors were detected along its depths, Graben Foss. The scientists determined, based on the InSight seismic data, that the low frequency of the deeper seismic waves implies the presence of a warm source zone 30 to 50 kilometers beneath the surface of Mars. This hot spot looks like magma that hasn't cooled yet, meaning earthquakes have happened recently or are still happening. So, the researchers concluded that the ground in this area is sinking because it is too heavy. Developing parallel rifts that distinguish the Martian crust, Cerberus Fossae earthquakes give crucial data because they account for at least 50% of Mars's seismic activity. In addition, when the InSight data was compared to orbital images of the Cerberus Fossae, 
It was determined that the earthquakes had occurred near a feature in the service force mantle unit that had previously been classified as a juvenile volcanic fissure. Researchers discovered darker dust deposits around this spot. The crack could have spread the dust in several ways, and the darker hues suggest that the geological data on Mars is relatively recent, possibly within the last 50,000 years. These findings imply that geological activity and volcanism continue to shape the Martian surface. But not all of Mars's rumbling is driven by internal action. On Christmas Eve of 2021, one of the more than 1,300 earthquakes reported by InSight was triggered by a meteor collision. A meteor hit Mars, causing the planet to shake forcefully enough to be detected by NASA's InSight mission. Local. Oh, for quite some time, the cause of this earthquake is unknown. But the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter captured images of a brand new impact crater on the planet. The crater was discovered to be approximately 500 feet wide, more than 10 times the typical size of a new crater on Mars. Additionally, there were water-rise chunks the size of boulders around the crater, which the explosion seemed to have thrown to the surface. We now know that Mars has changed significantly over its 4.5 billion year history, which shows how much we have learned about it. Mars was once covered in liquid water, meaning that the red dust ball, now blown around by the wind, was once a place where people could live. Even now, liquid lakes may persist beneath the surface, where life thrives. If similar biospheres exist on Mars, they must have a heat source to maintain a comfortable temperature. The heated molten magma is a beautiful heat source. The discovery of earthquakes near the Cerberus Fosse region of Mars could be one of the mission's most significant findings. The lander has significantly advanced our understanding of Mars's geology. Sadly, this may no longer be possible. Four years ago, Martian dust began accumulating on the InSight lander's solar panels. Later, a second dust storm struck, which could have been the fatal blow to the lander. A giant structure astounds astronomers. You are observing a visualization of the Saraswati supercluster, one of the most essential objects in the observable universe. Even light requires 650 million years to travel from one end of this giant to the other. So what is Saraswati composed of specifically? How did it get discovered? And what is its distance from us? The universe is a vast interconnected cosmic web. To begin with, galaxies are classified as stars, including our Sun. The galaxies are subsequently grouped together to form galaxy clusters. Superclusters are generated when galaxy clusters occasionally join. They can have baryonic masses several billion times that of the Sun and span tens to hundreds of megaparsecs. Hence, they track the most extensive scale structure of the cosmos, which encompasses dozens of galaxy clusters. Saraswati is a supercluster discovered by Ayaka and Issa, Indian researchers, in 2017. This celestial edifice was inspired by Saraswati, the Hindu goddess of music and knowledge. The distance to the supercluster is around 4 billion light years. One light year is the distance that the fastest entity in the universe, light, travels in one year, around 6 trillion miles long. This indicates that the supercluster's light was emitted 4 billion years ago when Earth was still young. You're certainly intrigued by how such a massive supercluster was discovered and what challenges and opportunities it presents to scientists. Please be patient. Saraswati was identified using extensive spectroscopic scanning of Stripe 82, a massive region of the sky. Afterwards, Statistical methods were utilized to link galaxies in space, thus discovering the Saraswati supercluster. It contains around 40 known galaxy clusters and vast cosmic voids. 
Significant clusters inside the cell generate a ray-like wall with powerful filamentous features that expands over time. A supercluster of this size and mass can test Einstein's theory of general relativity and structure formation, and validate various cosmological theories. This makes it one of the most important known superclusters and the most distant at 4 billion light years. Viewing it requires travelling back billions of years. Current estimates place the age of the universe at approximately 13.8 billion years. This indicates that the structure existed before the universe's age, which is 10 billion years, about 70% of its present age. This is a puzzling truth. Very early in the history of the cosmos, such a gigantic supercluster could not have formed, according to our current thinking. According to cosmological calculations, it is unlikely to discover such an enormous structure. Also, Saraswati's redshift of 0.3 puts her in the cosmic transition, where a world ruled by matter gives way to one ruled by dark energy. Is it not captivating? Another entity is associated with dark energy. What happens next? What else is left? Excellent scientific methods are used to investigate the physics underlying significant scientific findings. Further discoveries of these superstructures can constrain various cosmological models and the power spectrum of primordial density fluctuations, resulting in a deeper understanding of the universe's past. It provides astronomers with a great deal of freedom to investigate the formation of structures in the early universe. Saraswati's spectroscopic and X-ray discoveries which are necessary to validate the supercluster's bounds and redefine their overall mass content, are still being investigated by scientists. It is a rare discovery, since there are only a tiny number of superclusters of this size known in the cosmos, yielding solutions to numerous cosmic concerns and revealing previously unknown issues to the scientific community.